The climate change issue really falls into two different kinds of issue. One is what's called adaptation, which is coping with the effects of climate change. Whatever we do to try and stop the emissions which cause it, we are going to face, as a global community, huge changes in our climate over the next 30 years. Those are locked in from the past emissions of carbon dioxide and methane and so on that are the cause of the problem. And we have to do that whatever else we do. And the most affected groups of people in the world will be the poorest, as ever, and in the poorest countries, both because actually that's where temperature is going to rise by most and where water impacts, drought, and also possibly flooding are going to be worst, and also, of course, because those people are the most vulnerable and the least able to adapt. The horrible recognition that many of us have come to who work on this issue professionally is that actually we don't really know how to adapt to climate change in the poorest countries of the world. We talk, for example, about developing more drought-resistant crops. Now, that would be a great idea if we could have crops which were more resistant to drought, which were more uh, robust in different climatic conditions. But we haven't got them yet, so that's a scientific program. It isn't a development program at this stage. And it seems to me that in that context, the knowledge of our partner organisations, of the people we work with in poor communities, of ourselves on the ground is absolutely critical because our communities are now experiencing climate change and they're beginning to see how it's affecting them, the crops they grow, the water they, uh, they have available uh, to drink and so on, uh, the kinds of uh, temperatures they're facing and the adaptability of their social systems and so on, their housing. And that knowledge needs to inform the development professionals. And Insofar as now development professionals in donor organisations, in development ministries and so on, are beginning to understand the impact of climate change, I think they will welcome that. Certainly in the UK government, our Department for International Development is thinking very hard about climate change and acknowledges that it does not have the answers. How will we adapt our development plans, our aid programmes, to meet the, cha the challenge of a changing climate over the next 30 years? And so I think ActionAid has a really important role to use that knowledge and to develop the ideas of the communities we work with and the organisations we work with to help inform that process, both in, in country with the development planning ministries and so on, um, and with donor organisations and donor governments. The second part of climate change is about what's called mitigation, that is stopping the emissions or slowing down the emissions which cause climate change. And here we're in a very, very urgent terrain. At the moment we have uh, the Kyoto Agreement which lasts until 2012. All the countries that are concerned about this, and the UK uh, is one of those, um, know that if we are to make any kind of progress on reducing the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases over the next 20 years, we have to come to a new international agreement soon so that it can start in 2012 when the Kyoto Agreement runs out. And we're probably looking at, in international negotiation terms in 29 or 2010, after the next American presidential election, since very little progress is likely to be made before then. Um, but in time for an agreement to be ratified um, by uh, over 160 countries around the world. That doesn't leave us very long as a global movement um, to formulate the demands that we're going to make on the world's governments to come to an agreement that has a chance of slowing climate change down to tolerable levels. We haven't got very long, um, and in comparison with the global call to act on poverty and make poverty history, um, which took us quite a long time to get a global consensus, um, there's a lot of work to do. The fantastic thing about make poverty history and the global call was that there was, over time, developed a consensus amongst organisations in North and South, of which ActionAid played a crucial role internationally, um, on what governments needed to do. And that was then applied as pressure on all the major governments, particularly the G8, and although the results weren't what we wanted, they were more than we might have expected at the beginning. We haven't got very long to develop that global consensus. And it will be a call to reduce emissions clearly in the northern industrial countries. Um, that's crucial, and that's clear. We have to reduce them by considerable amounts, and we have to do it together through an international agreement. Clearly, any global consensus built up through civil society, through movements like Action Aid and all the partner organisations with whom we came together in the global call in Make Poverty History, um, we'll need to formulate the demands that we make on governments. 
And most of those demands will clearly be on northern governments, on Europe, on the United States, Canada, Japan, to call for big cuts in our emissions over time. That's what's going to have the major impact on climate change, is if we reduce, that is we, when I say this, I say the United Kingdom and similar developed countries, the emissions of greenhouse gases, which uh, we are responsible for. That's going to be the basis of the call. The interesting question is whether we say anything about the big developing countries, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and a few others. Per capita, their emissions are still small. And these are countries which are trying to take millions of people, in some cases billions of people, out of poverty. And yet, because they are so large countries, their total emissions, which is what contributes to global warming, are large. And they are the big, now, economic competitors of the industrialized countries. And if you listen to politicians now in Europe and America, they are worried about India and China competing with their economies. And the question is, what is the responsibility of those countries to an international agreement? I don't think it's the same responsibility, nobody does, as the responsibility of the developed countries. We, after all, caused the problem historically. The level of emissions in the atmosphere now has come from 200 years' worth of industrialization. Is mostly the responsibility um, of the currently industrialized countries. But I think it's difficult to see an agreement being reached with the United States or Europe or Japan unless there is some participation of the big developing countries to take part in a global emissions reduction effort. And so I think we've got two different tasks here on the, t on the side of mitigation. We should be developing globally with our partners, with similar organizations elsewhere, a call on the world's leaders to cut emissions and to do it through an international agreement in 29 or 2010. Most of that call will be on the leaders of developed countries. But we also have to work out what it is we're saying to the larger industrializing countries, which are still poor, but which will have some role to play. And as well as developing the call against the rich countries, we also have to work out what we're saying about the middle-income countries as well. And that's quite a challenge, and we haven't got very long to do it. <laughs>